quite feel quite privileged to be here because I'm sure you you people know a lot more about actual soil science and agriculture and stuff than I do because most of, most of the things I write about are generally to do with energy and architecture. So renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, solar architecture, zero carbon architecture, and I got into this uh, partly because you know I go a lot, grow a lot of stuff, and I'm very passionate about all of that. I've done most of the things that are in the book. Uh, on a kind of individual basis, but um, uh, it was Jane Davidson who wrote the One Planet Development Policy who asked me to write the book, <coughs> having read other stuff that I'd written. So that was really cool. Uh, but I'm really passionate about it. It's, it's something that I very much believe in. And, and what I bring to it from um, the energy side is this idea of measurement and verification. So I don't know if you know what that means, but it's basically how do you know whether what you're doing works? Mm. Where, uh, and we need evidence. And I, I feel that uh, in a lot of areas of life, like for instance uh, due diligence and accounting, or for instance energy management, we are very careful about managing, managing things and measuring them and seeing what works and what doesn't work, making corrections on an evidence-based position. So, but in other areas of life, um, we tend to be rather gung-ho and, and act on the basis of will wishful thinking and optimism and, oh, well, let's just see if it works. It sounds like it might work, you know. And, and, and too often, I find, in the field of sustainability, that is the case. So what I'm going to do with this is to make a plea for some kind of rigour and some kind of standards and measurement and verification. So uh, One Planet Development is a Welsh policy. It's been in place now since about 2010, so nearly seven years. <coughs> and it's, it's um, enshrined in a document called Technical Advice Note 8. Um, and it makes allowances for the idea that uh, people can live in a way commensurate to the fact we've only got one planet. Um, anywhere on the edge of an existing settlement, within a settlement and in the open countryside. But planning guidance was only ever written and has so far only been written for the open countryside. And the reason for that is because there was a development called Lamas which uh, wanted to do this and was getting into real problems with planners. And so Jane Davidson, who was then the Environment Minister in, in Wales, uh, brought in this special policy which allowed them to do it on the stringent, uh, point of very, very stringent conditions that we'll look at. And the reason, of course, is land values in the open countryside are low, and so the planners are very scared that if they give somebody the permission to build a house, there will be what they call unfettered development, and soon the whole place will be covered in concrete. So uh, that's why they make it really, really, <laughs> really, really difficult. Um, so you have to have a zero carbon home over its entire life, life cycle. So the construction period, living period, and when it <coughs> is taken to pieces at the end, hello, I've only just begun, so you haven't missed very much. You can come and sit at the front if you want. Um, uh, and you have to get 65% of your basic needs supplied from land-based activities, which is basically growing stuff. Um, or doing stuff on, on the land, with the land, actually using the land for some proper land-based purpose. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail. And, um, and using an ecological footprint analysis tool as a means of validating that you're bringing your consumption levels down. Okay, so, um, so let's talk about the overall context for this, which is the idea of planetary limits. The idea that we've only got one lovely, beautiful planet in the whole of the universe, as far as we know. And this is a few basic facts that, that um, people, I don't think, are sufficiently aware of. It's quite scary. Um, so we now have 7.5 billion people. 54% of them live in urban areas on the planet. And by the end of the century, it's gonna, there's going to be 11.2 billion people. And 84% of them living in urban areas. And um, so what's going to happen to the countryside? What's going to happen to the rural areas? Is a very big question as well as well how on earth are these people going to live sustainably? So you imagine these great big cities, urban me megatropolises, are going to be sucking in resources from all these rural areas. 
So the, according to WWF, there are a set of planetary boundaries, and four of them have passed the safe level. So climate change, biosphere, integrity, biogeochemical flows through the soil and the water flows, and la land system change. And as a result, on average, everybody over the planet uh, at the moment in terms of consumption is using the equivalent of 1.8 Earths to provide the goods and services we use, which is only going to increase, of course, as the population increases and consumption increases because there's more middle-class people. So um, the per capita ecological footprint of high-income nations dwarfs that of low- and middle-income na nations. Uh, let's have a look at this graph, which... Um, puts it in some other some more graphical perspective. So <coughs> historically, you can see that about 1974, population and consumption levels rose to the extent that we're going to exceed the capacity of the planet to support <coughs> the population. And it's been <coughs> going on ever since. And this breaks down, breaks it down into uh, six different categories, including the amount of land that's being used for growing crops, much of which, of course, is used for for uh, cattle and other uh, meat growing parts of agriculture, <coughs> built up land has increased, carbon has increased, uh, fishing has increased slightly, and grazing lands increased a little bit. But you probably know a lot more about things like soil loss as well than, than I do. And these are the planetary boundaries that I mentioned. And, um, you probably know we're living in one of the great periods of extinction, species extinction, there's like the sixth great species extinction. The last one was when meteorite destroyed the uh, dinosaurs and a lot more besides. Um, and problems, of course, do with phosphorus and nitrogen to do with the way that we treat the soil. Um, so this is, if you like, how the ecological footprint is worked out. It's basically, you, you take a... Uh, the biocapacity of, uh, uh, of, of, of land, kind of an average figure, <coughs> the area, of, total area of, of land on the earth, but not all of it is equal in terms of its productivity. So you kind of average it out, so that's the supply factor. And the demand factor is population times footprint times, uh, footprint intensity times consumption per person. Okay, so, um, Another way of looking at it, have you heard of Earth Overshoot Day? So it's like, the if you imagine at the beginning of every year, you start at scratch, of course you don't, but if you did, uh, at what date during the year would you actually overshoot? Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's getting earlier and earlier every year. I think last year it was about the middle of July. So we're like living on credit. So let's imagine a credit crash of 2008, uh, there's a lot of parallels between that. We live in a big bubble, and not enough people are really doing much about it. And this is the thing about the unequal consumption of the planet that I mentioned. So the darker colours represent the most consumptive nations on Earth. And for some reason, they include uh, <coughs> Sweden, <laughs> um, um, which, which actually, that's funny, because there, this is the Swedish Environmental Institute is actually the people who work out the ecological footprint. And um, so the, you can see where the, the, the lighter colours are the areas where there is the least consumption. Now, if you actually look and see what that means, so <coughs> the light pink colour is 1.75 giga hectare, uh, global hectare. So that, that's the unit that's used, so a hectare per person on average. So 1.75 global hectares per person, and in, the, the, uh, in North America and Australia and so on, it's seven good hectares per person, so it's a lot more. Um, but, uh, this, this is according to World Bank on Nature Living Planet Report, 1.7 giga hectares happens to be the available per capita share now, given the number of people on the planet and the consumption level. What does that mean? It means that people living in these areas are the only people on the planet who are actually living within our means. I'll let that sink in for a minute. Um, it, uh, I like to think it doesn't mean that we have to live like the people in a sort of Sims kind of lifestyle on a subsistence level that uh, people live there. Um, but it means that, that we've got to find a way of getting the best 
around modern technology and the best of traditional knowledge and somehow combine them in a way that is very low impact with a lot of resource we use, closed loop, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so that's the general challenge. And this, uh, in terms of uh, what it's like here in, in the UK, uh, with <coughs> about three planets <coughs> worth of stuff, and this is how it kind of breaks down. 27% uh, have an energy, 23% um, is food, and 17% transport, on average, 14% goods, 9% services, 7% government services, and infrastructure, 4%. Um, so th there we are. So uh, this is what the Welsh government policy is intended to address, this exact problem. As far as I know, it's the only country in the world which is trying to do this. Um, so, uh, but at the moment, only for, as I say, if you want to build a new house on the open countryside. Um, so we'll come to what we might do in other areas later in, in my talk. But so as I say, you've got to get your fo footprint down to 1.88 gigahectares. Now that's 1.88 because when the policy was put in place, that's what it was. That was the fair level. Well, now it's 1.7. So it's already gone down. So you've got five years once you get the planning permission to do this. And you have to report every year to the local authority planning department. And uh, at the end of five years, if you haven't got it to the right level and met all the other criteria, they can make you take it down and get off the land. Hasn't happened yet. <laughs> um, so 65% of your essential needs met from land-based <laughs> activities. Uh, I just, uh, skip to this, because this is what it actually means in practice. So 30% 30, 30 minimum can come directly. So you grow your own food and get your own firewood or whatever else you need. Make your own clothes if you want to. 35% um, from sales of goods and services that you provide from your land-based business or businesses. And the, the, other, the other can come from elsewhere. And what does minimum needs mean? Well, you actually start with a baseline, you measure it, you work out how much you spend on all the different things that you spend money on, and that's your baseline. So it really helps if you actually get that down to start with. So most people are starting, they figure it's going to be, if you take out uh, you know, rent and, or mortgage or whatever, it's about seven to 8,000 pounds. So that's what you're aiming for, you've got to get 65% of that figure within five years. Most people who've got there have done it so far. It's not, I mean, it's hard work, it's very hard work, but in that sense, it's actually training you to, to consume less, of course. Um, so you have to um, produce lots of reports, get a management plan, you have to produce a management plan that you give to the planning department for, for them to assess, and that's your five-year management plan. And it includes surveys of the biodiversity, surveys of the soil, cultural surveys, uh, heritage, and landscape. Take photographs, what's it going to look like when it's finished from all public viewpoints. Uh, you've got to have a sustainable water supply, because it's likely that there isn't a water supply on the site already. So you have to work out where your water comes from and how you're going to treat it. Sanitation, sustainable sanitation. So zero waste, 100% renewable energy. Wherever, that, wherever that's coming from, depending on the site. Zero carbon home, uh, so even when it's taken down at the end, end of its life, it leaves nothing there. You have to have an exit strategy, so there's, it, there's nothing left when you can go. And you minimise the carbon impact of your travel. Easy, huh? <laughs> and this is what the uh, <coughs> government's <coughs> ecological footprint calculator looks like. So it's all part of it anyway, you can scroll all the way down. You can go and get this on the Welsh Government website and type in One Planet Development and you get all the downloads on that page, including this Excel spreadsheet. And it's quite worth downloading it and trying to fill it out yourself and seeing what your ecological footprint is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically the number of people in the household, household annual income, and then it goes down, all the things you can spend money on in energy and transport and uh, food and clothing and everything else is put in there. 
as a figure either in pounds or if it's energy, ki kilowatt hours and so on, or, or miles travelled by a different form of transport. And uh, the calculations behind that then convert this into uh, global hectares. And so, um, yeah, this one worked out that uh, mine was 2.18, so I'm failing because I don't live on a one planet development. I, I live in a house, which is a 18th century listed old pub. But it's in the middle of a town, so I don't have to, I can build my shopping in a town and I don't have to go anywhere. Um, I, can grow, I grow quite a lot of my food, that's my excuse. Um, so, uh, have a go and do that if you can. Uh, it's, it's quite, you know, you learn quite a lot about where, where your footprint uh, is especially high. So, what areas could you bring it down in? Because it's one of the simplest things you can do, of course, not besides not flying, is to switch to a renewable energy tariff. And if you haven't got one already, switch to a renewable energy tariff. It's not really any more expensive. Um, and these are some of the benefits. So we are creating sustainable livelihoods. We're creating affordable housing. And part of the reason why it's affordable is obviously the land value is cheaper. But also a lot of people tend to build their own homes. Now, that's not replicable at scale. Um, but we've got ideas as to how that could change. Um, the, um, we're going to talk about the increased land productivity quite a lot. So I think that's probably what you're most interested in. I'm interested in hearing from you what you think about this. And efficient use of natural resources. Sustainable transport uh, comes from, well, you ideally, you're near a public transport uh, or you're using, so some people use uh, biofuel in their diesel cars. Some people you know, cycle a lot and they walk a lot. And um, some people have electric cars or electric bikes. So for me, a big thing is the fact that it's measurable. So you're knowing, you actually know that it works uh, or, or isn't working. Uh, it's good for the local community because you're producing uh, sustainable goods and organic food and so on, and you're selling it to, to the people around you. So in that sense, you're, they don't have to go to the supermarket and buy those things uh, otherwise. <coughs> So um, the housing aspect, I mean, these are, none of these houses on this slide are actually on uh, one planet development as such. But, they, but I like to show them because they're examples of, of uh, zero carbon houses which look attractive and are fairly conventional. So uh, historically, many of the houses that have been built on these developments so far tend to be what you would call hobbit houses. And you may have heard that one of them burnt down. Did, you, did anybody hear that? Uh, a couple of weeks ago. And that was Jasmine and Simon's house and, uh, at Lamath. And uh, it's very, very sad um, because uh, their house won the Grand Designs uh, Award uh, a couple of years ago. <coughs> it took five years to build. And um, there's pictures in my book of it going up. And it's an earth, partly earth built into an earth bank with timber frame and straw bale, but it was an electrical fire, a uh, faulty plug, and, it, and they weren't insured, because it's very hard sometimes to insure these places. So probably they couldn't even afford it. Um, anyway, it's a beautiful house. I'm not saying that a lot of these houses aren't beautiful, but uh, it's incredibly labor intensive. There's a, there's a lot of sort of cob work and sort of putting getting clay on the, you know, lots, a lot of volunteers worked on it year. Um, hopefully they'll start again. There's been a fund and uh, they've got about £50,000 so far, which is more than they ever had before. So maybe they'll go on holiday. I don't know. Uh, anyway, T Solar, T is um, Welsh for house. Um, that is made from local larch in a local factory and it's a prototype. And we hope to use, use that design more. A guy called Glenn Peters built the first solar farm in Wales and with the money from that he des developed this design. He's now built a village of these uh, s uh, 
six of the, of the units are affordable houses to rent and two of them are to buy at a higher price, subsidise those. And uh, they're insulated with warm cell, which is recycled newsprint, uh, so it, 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 it's very eco. That's uh, Rachel Sharma's straw bale house is uh, near Abatiri, and that is uh, the only, as far as I know, three-storey, frameless straw bale house. There's no timber frame. It's just backing straw bales, one on top of the other, <coughs> and it's three storeys high. Um, quite impressive. And th th these ones is a housing estate um, that's in Swindon, <coughs> and they're uh, made of hemp timber frame and hempcrete. So hempcrete is lime and hemp mixed together into a kind of a kind of concrete, which is eco concrete because it absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and it's a nice development because it's based on a kind of village green idea. Uh, so everybody looks out onto the play area for the kids, and uh, I like that approach. Um, so, yeah, normal building regs apply, of course. And um, uh, we're hoping that, uh, well, I'll tell you a bit more in a little while, but we're going to develop a, an eco village along these lines. So, um, you know, I've had a slide like this. The important thing about this is, I think, uh, in terms of agriculture, is no subsidies. They're doing this without subsidies. And um, so that also it improves the local economy, and uh, or the national economy. Um, and I'll give you some figures in a couple of slides. But uh, produce is wide and varied, and it's marketed with a label, uh, One Planet Produce. And so there's a few different, few varieties, different examples of things. Um, you know, vinegar, basket work, honey, um, sea salt. And they're allowed to, although obviously the sea salt doesn't come from the land, but the petals that go in it do. Um, and there's a woman who grows lots of lots of flowers and sells them and also makes cosmetics out of the flowers and the oils and what have you. Um, and there are even people who, who, u who use the land for social purposes, so they'll have prisoners, uh, for ex-offenders coming or drug addicts coming and helping out working on the land or people who are mentally ill uh, and so on can come and help out on the land and that can count as well. So this is the productivity data. This is what's interesting to me. Um, so this is from Lamas. Now Lamas was a sheep farm. They were a typical upland sheep farm. And so obviously it originally just supported one family with subsidies for the sheep. Now there are nine families living there and they've been there for six years now. Um, <coughs> and this shows the value of means met directly from the site, nearly 60,000, and the income. And then they run courses as well, so you're allowed to include that. People come there and learn all about this stuff. So there's a total. And, um, and you can see that they've nearly met all of their household needs from these land-based activities. So 92% actually of their uh, needs were met <coughs> from the land. So prior to this conversion, a single farmer's annual income was a pro profit, if you like, of two and a half to three and a half thousand pounds from sheep, not including the subsidy. Right, so that's a 30-fold increase in land-based productivity. So why is that? Uh, can you mm -hmm. answer that question? Why is that? Well, economically, um, that kind of farming is very, very well observed from many sheep farmers usually. Mm -hmm. So it's a well-based compared with. Mm. So part of it, of course, is that there's a lot more attention paid mm -hmm. to the land. So if you're, if you're responsible for a small area of land, well, it's not small, they've got about six acres each, but um, you, can, you can spend a lot more time doing it, farming it much more intensively, and rotation crops, so as soon as something mm -hmm. comes out, you put something else in, and so on and so forth. So, um, and, and you, get, you can keep on top of the pests that way, because you're always walking around it every day, you're inspecting it and doing work on it and so on. Um, so even though it's organic, 
it's 34. Now, people find this very hard to believe, especially con in conventional farming. So you say, well, what else do you do? You can't, you can't expect nine pound risk. It's just a hill pond. It's just there's nothing there with grass, <laughs> you know. And they don't get it, you know. Uh, but I think, for me, this is the most powerful argument that there is for the value of this kind of land management practice. Sorry, what's it? So it's a nine families who share yeah. it through their but Well, this is they're not sharing <coughs> it, but this is, this is the total of, of, of all of their separate incomes. But added they have together. other sources of income. They might well do, if they, uh, but we don't count for that. We don't count for that. They might do, they might not, um, because it's, it's very hard work. And you've got five, five years to start from scratch to prepare the soil, plant everything, to build a house, uh, as well as bring up your kids and do all those other things as well. And get your business going, find a market for it. So it's, in, it, it's incredibly hard work. So if you've still got time for another job after you're doing that, well, good luck. Can I just ask you about that figure of two and a half, three and a half thousand pounds of annual income? Yeah, that, that's... that's that the subsidy? Yeah, a, a, a lot, a lot of uh, no. That that's. I mean, that's basically what he's goes after his costs. That's what he's got to live on, and a lot, a lot of them are, are own their own houses. Don't forget, and they own the land. So, that but that's it. it. It it's really really hard work being a farmer. That's why a lot of them are giving up. And we're not talking about those rich landowners who, who own lots of plots and you know lots and lots of individual farms and stuff. We're talking about your average farmer who's been, had it in the family for a few generations. It's it's really not easy at all, and that's why they are diversifying a lot of them. Mm. You know, they're, they're getting holiday cottages, uh, and they're they're putting solar panels on the roof, whatever they're doing, anything they can do to get. Um, uh, more income to supplement it. So my um, thesis and my appeal to you, if you know it could, can help in any way at all, is that we need more data like this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are now over 30 households in Wales, and there's a lot more in the, in the planning pipeline, but um, there are now over 30 that are producing this kind of data because they have to. <coughs> and they have to do it <coughs> planning, it's planning condition. Uh, but nobody at present is collating it, so it's, it's potentially very valuable data, particularly where, where, where conversion is in involved from, from uh, previous more conventional agriculture. Um, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, there was a report that came out in the latter half of last year uh, from the land workers. Well, there must be somebody mm -hmm. here maybe okay. involved in that. Yes. Uh, but th th these are figures from there. So you were involved in that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you see, a center of Africa. Yeah. yeah. That's how that out uh, proportion. Yeah. Yeah. So um, thi this, as far as I know, was the first attempt to do a similar thing already. Because uh, I was really surprised when, when I was writing, writing this book, I wanted to find evidence um, to support this kind of farming style and growing style. And, and there's very, very little out there. And I, the Permaculture Association, for some reason, uh, has not encouraged people to, to do research on the value of permaculture in terms of productivity. Um, so it's very been very hard to get any data out of them. They don't have it. So I was very pleased when this report came out. I mean, it's a great piece of work. And uh, there's a lot more information in it besides this, of course. Um, but it, it, uh, it also shows the ways in which this kind of small holding approach uh, works as well as and the ways in which it doesn't work. So it's obviously going to work in something. And part, part, of part of it, which as you saw from the slides as well, or the pictures of the produce, is, is adding value to the products. So you process them in some way or another to add value to it. So y if you were just trying to make money selling potatoes, you'd find it really hard. Um, but if you're selling something made out of potatoes, you know, uh, you can charge more for it. Um, and 
and direct marketing um, as well. So community support of agriculture, box schemes, farmers markets, selling directly means that you can uh, cut out the middle person. Um, and as well, you inputs and waste are reduced. And by growing a lot of different kinds of things as well, you're more resilient because if one crop fails, some others will, won't fail. Uh, so, these figures from 2009 to 10, um, so it's not that different now, but this is obviously what may well change post Brexit. So, the average subsidy for a sheep farm is 53,000, net farm income 33,000. So, therefore, the average farmer could be said to be <coughs> subsidising their income by 20,000. Uh, these figures, are, they are from a different source uh, than the other one. I think all the sources are at the bottom of the, of the slide. Um, so what they call less favoured areas are these areas that are used for sheep in Wales. And that's why there are so many sheep <laughs> in Wales, partly anyway, partly because of the subsidies, obviously, but the way it works, well, they classify the land as less favoured um, for this reason. Um, <coughs> but actually... Um, the uh, National e Ecosystem Assessment uh, says that in, in reality, 37.4% <coughs> of Wales could be encl uh, enclosed farmland, improved grassland, and just 3.5% arable and horticultural. But it, it didn't used to be like that, you know. Uh, I live quite a little way up the Towery Valley, and I've found... Um, testimonies from farmers uh, going back to the 1920s and I've got uh, an entire year what, what was actually done in, in a year to the farms in the upper Tally Valley um, which is sort of like that shape it's a sort of classic sort of glaciated valley so um, you know they, they go up here uh, on, the, on the hilltops in, in the summer and come down in, in the winter but they'd use a lot of the uh, valley floor for growing vegetables and even wheat, and and they share a lot of their activities together, um, the threshing activities, and, and so on. So uh, it was possible in those days um, for them to be more or less self-sufficient, but they certainly couldn't afford to buy anything in. So the bottom line for that is, if if you do that sum and you believe those figures, then if you convert an existing sheep farm into LPD, you could save an average of £53,000 taxpayers' money. You make the land more productive. Of course, you're improving biodiversity as well, so you're attracting lots of other species in and reducing carbon emissions from livestock and from the soil. So you're also improving the, ca the carbon content of the soil because you're farming organically. So this is what we're lobbying for uh, post-Brexit in the, the farming um, consultations that are going on and if it went like this you can imagine that the countryside would be recolonised so it's a funny thing um, where a lot more people used to live in the countryside in Wales than, than they do now and you, you can see that because there's a lot of ruined farmhouses all over the place and many of them of course have been bought, bought up by people from second homes and converted and stuff but there's still quite a few that you can find knocking around or others uh, just be merge into the landscape, you know, fallen down. You stumble across them as you're walking through a wood. <coughs> um, so, uh, but, you know, the Brexit vote happened and uh, Wales did vote to leave, of course. And most of the people who voted that, they were, you ask them, they're afraid of immigration. They say, well, we haven't got the space. And they say, well, look out the window. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't understand it. You know, actually, we need more people because it's really hard to live where I live, to make a living. It's really, really hard for most people um, because there aren't enough people to sell to. There aren't enough people to come and buy in the shops. You know, So it, it, it is really hard. But uh, there'll be a benefit for, from a higher level of population density if it was introduced in a sensitive and sustainable manner. Um, so the land could be better used. 
And you know, we don't make enough of use of the sheepskin that, that we have anyway. You know. <coughs> could use it for um, insulation, for instance. So the question then came in my mind, what about um, peri-urban uh, OPD? So this is where I live. This is Clandervuy. So this is the upper Tawi Valley that I was just talking about. And uh, it's, a, it's a modest little town, 2,000 people. Um, and uh, Clandervuy in the Welsh means a uh, church by the waters because it's about four or five rivers come together down different valleys. Uh, it's an ancient Roman, Roman site because it's strategic position. There were gold mines up, up the valley up there and lead mines. And so it's a lot of, uh, a lot of history in it. It's a very strategic place and it's very fertile, all this, all this land. Um, so the Tawi Valley comes down here and then goes down this, this part here. Now, um, I work partly for this organisation called Callan Cymru Network. So Callan Cymru means heart of Wales. Callan means heart. And um, the heart of Wales refers to the railway line. It goes from Ammonford, or from Swansea to Ammonford, and then all the way up to Shrewsbury. Has anybody been on that railway line? Lovely little line, little single, dinky little line. So the railway line comes <coughs> up here, this station, and carries on up that way. And um, so the idea of Callum Cymru network it is because towns like this have been neglected by policymakers, they're in decline because of the ageing demographic, um, there's been closing services like hospitals and schools. Um, they need regeneration. So um, we want to have one planet type developments alongside these uh, settlements all the way up and down the line through rural Wales. So um, we uh, did a feasibility study last year. We commissioned a feasibility study and that's been uh, produced in November. And uh, it said, yeah, it's possible, but it's difficult because of land prices, mainly land availability. Um, but we're setting up community land trust, and we're quite optimistic. We've got some benefactors on board who can buy some land. And um, so, you know, we're slowly inching this thing <coughs> forward. Meanwhile, I do things like talk to architecture students in Swansea University, Trinity St. David University, and they did a survey of the town, and they, they, did, a, they did a plan for a sustainable one planet type development on the edge of this town. We're not just looking at this town, we're looking at some others up and down the line, like Clandilo as well. Um, <coughs> but that's not all. Um, there's also this concept that we're supporting of a patchwork farm. <coughs> so a patchwork farm means uh, that anybody who grows stuff can give it to a central place uh, to be bought from. And if you're a consumer, then you can see what's all for sale and order it. It's like a box scheme. But instead of, instead of it coming from one place, it can come from lots of different places. So um, this, this uh, is uh, what we call a, a station hub. And this is a Clandilo station. And that's uh, Sara, and Sara works at uh, in, uh, Black Mountain Food Hub and Red Pig Farm. Red Pig Farm is applying to become a one planet development, and it's about 60 acres of woodland, not far away. Um, and they, they, run this, they run this whole thing. And uh, so people order it, as I say, and come pick it up from this, this specially built uh, hub. <coughs> which is designed to be li like, rather like a, an old railway truck. Um, and it's quite nice. And, uh, and so that, that's another idea of how we can support this kind of um, community-supported agriculture, organic agriculture. But, of course, at the moment, it's just scratching the surface. So how do we do it at scale? So I'm, I'm a great fan of looking around, trying to find <coughs> things that work, <coughs> in other places. And I'm just going to give you a couple of these. Um, so this is in, oh, way over in Greater Toronto, uh, <coughs> near the uh, USA border. There's uh, Lake Ontario. And so you've got a lot of uh, uh, urban development there, um, what they call the, glo the, the golden horseshoes. This is sort of, I don't know why they call it golden, but it's sort of a horseshoe around the lake. 
And um, so in, <coughs> in 2011, uh, the seven municipalities there got together and said, we want to make our food sustainable, food supply sustainable. And so they, they had a 10-year plan, and they started talking to suppliers and uh, landowners and uh, farmers in this whole region. Um, and the idea was, is to get the consumers linked up with the producers, to make people more aware where their food comes from, and uh, have health and consumer education about the benefits of this way of, of growing food and so on. And they had to create new policy tools to be able to do it, which is obviously quite difficult, and uh, there not everybody could come on board. The problem was the main problem was big agriculture because they saw it as a threat. But I think you know eventually w it they should they should come round because I don't think they'll have much choice. Um, but uh, that's this one idea. So hinterland approach because of course in the old days cities mostly were fed by their hinterlands, weren't they? Or and it's only about 110, 120 years ago that Paris was self-sufficient. And every night, you know, every morning people took the night soil out, put it on the land, and they came back with maybe produce and brought it in, and everybody ate it and grown in, in allotments around, around the edge of the town. And that pattern was reflected um, all over the world. So this hinterland approach is feasible, but of course we live in a global era where... Um, uh, things come from all over the world to our local supermarket stores. But we've got to kind of stop that if we want to bring down our ecological footprint to the proper level. Uh, this is one thing, that one consultation that's happening in Wales at the moment. Is, um, it's called the National Development Framework and it's about looking more strategically at... Um, how Wales works on, on a service provision basis <coughs> and uh, this is covering absolutely everything from police and, and uh, hospitals and uh, schools and, and transport and so on. Um, but they're pr proposing that uh, Wales is split into four main regions and uh, so we've given uh, feedback to the consultation processes which is still ongoing and suggested this idea of, of, uh, of hinterland. So basically you've got um, a conurbation in this area here, the Swansea, uh, Neathport, Talbot and so on, all the steel works down here. You've got the uh, majority of people living in, in um, Cardiff and Newport, and the valleys, the North Coal Mining Valleys down up here, and, and you've got a whole city population here as well in Bangor and Carnarvon and the Conwy. Um, and much of the rest <coughs> of Wales <coughs> is empty. And, and I've heard politicians say, what's it for? You know, they fly from the top to a meeting down in Cardiff and go over it and they look down and go, why is it there? It's just in the way. <laughs> <laughs> they can't see the point of it. But of course, you know, they're looking at it and thinking, well, we don't want to keep it in here. So this is what could happen. They could be the, the, bar, the food basket of, of these urban areas. This is, this is my deal. And so uh, the next thing is to have uh, policies that mandate that they purchase a certain amount of their food from within a nearby area. So um, this could happen with the Wellbeing of Future Generations. So the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in Wales is uh, been in place for about a year and a half, two years now. And it means, it's basically their version of sustainable development. And uh, they are looking way up, 1,500 years. So within that time, they want to get the ecological footprint of Wales right down, and also all the sustainable development goals to get them embedded in policy. And it applies to all publicly funded activities, so at all branches of government, right down to how, how any public money is spent, um, hospitals and schools, and so on. So, she might mean, hospitals and schools have 
kill the policy that linked them with nearby farms, how that would work. So the farms, uh, the suppliers, would have a guaranteed market, which would enable with their produce, which would enable them to plan. The schools would get really good local, healthy food, and the kids in those schools can visit the farm, and they can even work on the farm. They can see, they can see where their food comes from and have a hand in growing food and rebuild that connection with the land that we've lost. <coughs> so, you know, I, uh, why can't this happen? So we start, some, some of us are starting to talk to some schools, so uh, in Canterbury, there's Canterbury <coughs> College, which literally is a private school, they're already starting to do this, and they're getting kids growing their own, their own um, foods, and uh, at the weekend we were planting a community orchard with them, and, and so on. So we also see that um, if uh, there is a, 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 a one planet neighbourhood built on the edge of the town, then the college already does a BTEC in agriculture, so that it could be there that people learn the new kind of farming skills that we're talking about. Um, and in fact, this is uh, an existing new development on the edge of Sacramento, in California. And uh, it is actually built around an agricultural college. So uh, all, all the uh, accommodation is done in this area, and there are some gardens. But most of the gardens and the growing happens up here. And there's a whole lot of different uh, kinds of accommodation catered for, from big, large family homes you might expect in America, to small one or two big bedroom rented affordable flats. Um, and uh, the college, as I say, where people, people are learning how to grow food on the land, and then have a community supported agriculture kind of set up where there's a shop in the market hall where local residents can buy the food that's grown here. And uh, along here, there is a cycle route and a bus lane that you can get into town easily. So, uh, although um, it's not com not all of completely affordable housing, um, it is, uh, to my way of thinking, uh, one potential model for this kind of community. So everyone would get involved in the growing, no. like even the other no, houses? No, no, so no. Only some, only some people get involved in okay. the growing. The rest of the people, they just live whatever. Mm -hmm. Because they have, you know, you have to have system where, which enables you to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's partly what I'm kind of talking about. Um, see, what kind of in the open countryside mostly done by individuals. Sometimes, you know, you've got a, a group of four people, four, four households coming together. Some of the grandmas did nine. Um, but really, they're each doing their own thing. They've each got their own business plan. They're each running their own set of businesses. Um, they're not doing it together. Um, Whereas, if you start to go up from there, from 20, 30 or more households at a time, then you've got the opportunity to do things at scale. So, for instance, you could employ, a few people can be employed uh, running the energy supply system, um, with whatever it is, solar panel, and water power, and wind turbines, heat pumps, and that kind of thing. Uh, they could be maintaining that, keeping that going. Some people can be uh, preoccupied with the water supply and water treatment system. Some people might get together and decide they want to have a market gardening business and some polytunnels and grow stuff in there, and so on. Um, so it means that people can specialise in what they're really good at instead of having to be good at everything. Um, and it also means that there'll be some people who'll be able to live there and just get on with their own life and do their own thing, like be teachers or, or whatever it is that they do. If you still need all this. Um, so these are there are obviously many challenges and uh, amongst them the kind of kind of regulations need to be changed, um, need to change due to definitions of, 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 of what is possible to do in different places, particularly in towns, because if you want to have a uh, for instance a vertical farm in a town often it's not possible because there isn't a future definition of what it is that you're, you're proposing to do and they'll come up with all kinds of health and safety reasons why you can't do it. Uh, land price and ownership I mentioned as well. Um, it, it's always a big barrier. You're up against big developers um, who have the ears of the government and, uh, and uh, councils. Lack of awareness of the kind of thing that we're talking about. Best of interest, I'm not even um, so, 
we were painting as a one planet council, which was formed to um, support Earth Africa and its own planning partners, Biofair Training, and do some research with the years with the Welsh Government, and do the kind of thing that I'm doing with you now. Uh, and uh, it's, since we formed it, we've made a lot of difference, because before we were there, a lot of planning applications were getting turned down, and people were getting very despondent. But since we've uh, been in existence, there have been some turned down, but uh, on the appeal, and uh, they won on appeal, uh, which has been great. Uh, this is a book, which, uh, if you're interested, uh, of course, I have a few copies. It's <laughs> a uh, big book on absolutely everything. Uh, and I suppose if I'm just some sort of some what I'm saying up, um, I, I believe that this approach should actually be universal. That people need to think one planet when they do anything. Because we've only got one planet, we always to forget that. We get stuck in our silence, and it's the mentality. And it's partly what the Wellbeing and Future Generation Act is, is about. I was at a workshop last week in Cardiff where they commissioned somebody from uh, the university um, uh, to assess if there's any evidence that the act has made any difference to the way government works so far, and the answer is done. So, <laughs> the only difference, I'm both of you, well, what is this, you know, uh, pay lip service to it, you know. Um, so they commissioned a series of three workshops, bringing in branches of government and people from NGOs like me to come brainstorm ways in which they can change. So they really do want to change, but it's very hard to change your way of working so that you think, think like this, think holistically. Um, so really, you know, the same set of social and environmental criteria that I've been talking about for one planet should actually be applied to almost anything. Of course, you could hope to be, make it easier, much easier to do than it is at the moment for the people who are doing it. But that's, as I say, it's the advantage of doing it at scale. Um, and measure it. So whether you use it, you go to a footprint analysis or whether you use other existing international standards um, it doesn't matter, but as long as you all agree on what standard you're going to use to actually qu qu quantify the, your progress, baseline it and then see it, set targets and try to get there. First, I think that towns could become one planet towns. They can decide to be a one planet town and say, right, in 50 years' time, this is where we're going to be, and set a whole lot of targets for every single activity that they do, whether it's energy, water, land, land use building, whatever, uh, and try to move that in stages over that time. And then they can declare, they can, like fair trade towns, like transition towns, mm -hmm. they can just declare an ambition to do this and then get everyone together around the table and work out how they're going to get there. So that's uh, my suggestion. Uh, because I believe that with the imagination, we can save the world. Mm -hmm. I really think it's mm -hmm. the guiding philosophy. Mm -hmm.